Hi, this is Julie Newmar, and you're watching Mr. Media. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to Charles Ardai, editor of the Hard Case Crime Detective Fiction series. He's also a consulting producer to Haven, one of my favorite shows on the Sci-Fi Network. Stick around, and please, keep your emotions and your personal troubles to yourself. <laughs> I'm perfectly capable of going up in flames all by myself. Today's episode of Mr. Media Interviews is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. You know GoDaddy.com from their wild and sexy commercials, but isn't it time you actually test drove their web hosting and domain registration services yourself? For a limited time, Mr. Media listeners can save 10% on the already low price of web hosting services at GoDaddy.com by entering the promo code POD4 at checkout. Again, that's 10% off web hosting when you go to GoDaddy.com and enter the promo code POD4, that's P-O-D, the number 4, at checkout. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of scruffy young actors and actresses whose characters suffer through some pretty frightful special effects in a small Nova Scotia fishing village masquerading as an imaginary town in Maine, in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Charles Ardai was a guest on Mr. Media just a few weeks back here to talk about his yeoman's work tracking down, restoring, and in some ways completing novelist James M. Cain's lost final manuscript, The Cocktail Waitress. He was telling me that his book imprint, Hard Case Crime, which published Stephen King's short story, The Colorado Kid, on which the sci-fi series Haven is based, will be bringing out a new King book in 2013. Now, as often happens during these conversations, in that moment, I learned something completely unrelated but of great interest to me personally. In addition to being the co-founder and editor of the Hard Case Crime imprint, Ardai is also a consulting producer to Haven, the wicked cool supernatural drama on the Sci-Fi Network. It stars the beautiful and haunting Emily Rose, who you might recognize from HBO's John from Cincinnati or ABC's Brothers and Sisters as Audrey Parker, and Lucas Bryant as Sheriff Nathan Warnos, and as bad boy Duke Crocker, six feet under veteran Eric Balfour. And Balfour, incidentally, before I forget, was a guest on Mr. Media late in the first season, uh, and it's a great interview if you are a fan of Haven and you haven't heard it yet, so look for that on the site. So, with the third and best yet season of Haven reaching a crescendo, I invited Ardai to come right back to talk about his moonlighting in TV, as well as to tell us a little bit more about hard case crime. Charles Ardai, welcome back to Mr. Media. It's a pleasure to be here. It's like the old uh, old neighborhood. I, you know, I've had people on multiple times before, but I can't <laughs> remember ever having anyone this quickly. It's a close succession. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. It, it's it's great to be back. Yeah. What are you doing in January? We should schedule something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, we've uh, we've got some pretty cool things coming. We'll, we'll talk about that. All right. All right. Well, I, I, let's start with. I mean, the last time you were here. Um, uh -huh. We were talking about crime books, and as I said in the introduction, you kind of surprised me. Uh, we were talking about Colorado Kid, and you, I didn't realize that that was a hard case. And, and you mentioned um, that, you know, of course, the Colorado Kid was the inspiration for Haven. Um, I, 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 what I didn't ask you, because I wanted to save that, was how it made the leap from hard case to TV. 
Well, it, it's interesting. So Stephen King did us a, a great favor. He was very generous to let a scrappy young upstart book publishing line like Hard Case Crime publish his new book. Any publisher in the world would have been glad, would have leapt at the chance to publish his book, but he liked what we were doing. He was a fan of old Pulp Fiction, just like we were, and he wanted to support us, wanted to help us out. And so he allowed us to publish what was his first new book after he had announced his short-lived retirement. Uh, but no one knew it would be short-lived, so it was a very exciting time. And The Colorado Kid came out to some of the best reviews we ever had, as well as the worst reviews we ever had. And in fact, Steve himself wrote an afterword to the book, and if you get a copy of the book, you'll find it, where he said, look, people are either going to love this book or they're going to hate this book. There won't be any in between. The reason was that unlike most mysteries, which pose a lot of unanswered questions, but by the end of the book, they answer them, such as, how did this man turn up on a beach and uh, wind up dying? When he was at uh, a job in Colorado in the morning, how did he end up dead on a beach in Maine by night? That's a great question. In a normal mystery novel, it would get answered on the last page. But Steve wanted to tell a story about unanswered questions, about the frustration of having questions that you never learn the answer to. And sure enough, you get to the end of the book, The Colorado Kid, and these core questions are still unanswered. And of course, people who want a solution to their mysteries went crazy. They went ballistic and said, that's not what you want from a mystery novel. But I'll tell you what it is, what you want from it. It's uh, for a TV show. A story that poses a lot of unanswered questions and doesn't tie them up neatly in a bow is actually quite appealing because you have a reason to come back the next week and there's more to discover. This was around the time that Lost was very popular and Lost became popular by posing all sorts of questions that they never answered. And then eventually, of course, people got frustrated after eight seasons. But in the first two, three seasons, it was great fun. And so I went to the producers of a show called The Dead Zone, which was also based on uh, one of Stephen King's works. And that was sort of wrapping up. I think it was in its final season or had just finished its final season. And I uh, talked to them and said, you know, uh, that show is going off the air or, or just went off the air. Would you be interested potentially in a new Stephen King property that has some of the same uh, quality of dealing with unanswered questions that the most popular show on TV, Lost, has? That's where the conversation started. Um, and then the producers who were very interested in it brought on the writing team of uh, Sam Ernst and Jim Dunn to flesh out the world of the novel and turn it into something that felt more uh, characteristically Stephen King. Because the novel, for example, doesn't have any explicit supernatural elements at all. Oh, really? Uh, but if you're going to put a show on the air and tie it into Stephen King's mythos, you really want some supernatural component to it. Now, secretly behind the scenes, I like to think there was a supernatural element even to the book, but it was very much, you had to read between the lines to find it. Uh, in any event, we worked on it for about three years. The producers originally sold the rights to ABC, which had done a number of Stephen King miniseries. Um, a script was written for a pilot. It sat for probably two years. Um, then we got the rights back and were able to reach a deal with Sci-Fi in the U.S., with E1, which is the Canadian co-producer. Uh, that resulted in our going up to Nova Scotia to film. And, uh, and the show got on the air, which is a miracle if uh, any, any show, no matter how... It's always a miracle if it gets on the air. And then that it got a second season, a third season, and was just renewed for a fourth season. I feel profoundly grateful uh, to have the chance to work on such a good show. Well, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point out, I was, I was going to tell you anyway, but since you, you mentioned uh, the ending of Colorado Kid, the book, I, you know, once I got into the series, I decided, sorry, but I decided not to read the Colorado Kid because I was afraid, I didn't know all this controversy, I was afraid that it would tell me something I didn't want to know before the series ran its course, so I have... Yeah. Well, never fear. In fact, you made the smarter decision because if you had decided to get The Colorado Kid, you'd find that it's a very highly sought-after, expensive collector's item because the book went out of print after three years. It was our deal with the author. Uh, we would publish the book for three years, and then at the end of three years, it would go off sale, off the stands. There was um, the potential that he might bring it out then with his, his usual publisher, which is Scribner, uh, or in some other way, but he never did. So that book has been unavailable in bookstores. I think there's an ebook version, maybe an audiobook version, but the actual physical is 2009, and there are no current plans to uh, bring it back anytime soon uh, so in fact it's very hard for you to read the colorado kid even if you want to i feel much better now about my decision <laughs> um, go ahead does uh does hard case uh, profit from this having gone to series or is it mostly steven that uh... Um, the rights were held by stephen king when a book publisher buys the rights to publish a book it's pretty rare especially when dealing with an author of 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 substance like Stephen King, but really with any writer. It's rare that you get film and TV rights. Those are usually held by the author, and if there's a sale, the way the publisher makes money is by selling additional copies of the book. So, for instance, George R. R. Martin probably does, in fact, get a fee from the producers of the TV show Game of Thrones on HBO, but his real 
uh, money-making opportunity is that his books have been on the bestseller list ever since the show debuted. Um, that would be the case for us, too, if the book were still in print, but it's not. So, uh, so we actually, Hard Case Crime does not actually uh, get fees or anything like that, which is fine. You know, we're still very proud of it. I do get uh, paid for my own work as a producer and a writer on the show, but it's not a Hard Case Crime thing. And uh, was part of your uh, taking it uh, to the producers of uh, The Dead Zone, I think you mentioned, uh, was that simply to, to get uh, more more done with this story, or were you looking for that opportunity to be a consulting producer, or what's how how, how do the two connect? I guess is what I'm wondering. It's it's a fair question. You know, I we didn't have um, any film or TV rights, so there was no reason that we needed to be involved. It could have been as simple as a conversation where I said to them, here, you should read this book, and they took it from there, and we weren't, weren't involved at all anymore. And that would have been fine. I would have been perfectly happy with that outcome. But the truth is, like every other writer of books and magazine stories and magazine articles, I always harbored a desire to try my hand at television. It's I love television, and I thought, wouldn't it be a fun thing to do? And so when Haven actually did get off the ground, I asked if they would mind if I got involved a little bit more, and they were very decent about it. You know, here's this uh, guy from the East Coast. I'm not in L.A. I'm not in Nova Scotia, the two locuses of activity. Uh, they didn't need to involve me as much as they have, but they have allowed me to be involved to, to a great extent, and I'm very grateful for it. So each year when the uh, new season kicks off, I go up to L.A., spend a week in the writer's room helping to, uh, you know, listening to the ideas for storylines and helping to flesh them out. And then during the year, I consult on the scripts as well. So I, I think it's, uh, it's a privilege to get to do that, and hopefully I'll get to do it again for season four. And uh, so that explains sort of what you do as a consulting producer. And, and I also understand you've written uh, scripts in two of the three seasons so far? That's right. In, uh, in season one, there was a, a script called Resurfacing about uh, a family where the father has vanished. And the question is, where did he go? Is he dead? What happened to him? Um, and there's a big revelation at the end of the episode that gives us an insight into Audrey Parker's true nature. Before that, we didn't really understand what the connection was between Audrey and her lookalike from 27 years ago, Lucy Ripley. Uh, then the, uh, the one that's coming up, Actually, tomorrow night. So by the time this airs, it's gonna. Have, yeah, I could probably talk about all the secrets. But just to be safe, uh, there's another big relation at the end of tomorrow night's episode as well. Although it's not about uh, Audrey, it's about the mystery that we've been setting up all season long. The guards. The guards, uh, the guards are involved. The guards are the group of uh, people in Haven who help the troubled. They're troubled themselves, and they pull out all the stops for helping other troubled people. Uh, but there's a serial killer in Haven in season three. Uh, He's no bolt, bolt gun, gun killer. killer. Yeah is who, who was he really and what was his agenda? Well, you won't necessarily find out the answer to the second question in tomorrow night's episode, but you'll know a lot more about him than you do now. Uh, and, and I hope people like what they see. Uh, I don't want to give too much away, but didn't we learn in the last couple of weeks who he is? Or is that... We learned a little bit about who he is, oh. but still mysteries remaining. Interesting. Of course, we, don't, we, we, never did find, we didn't find out at that point what motivated him. Oh, there you go. Exactly. Yeah, I, okay. Interesting. Well, we pace out the revelations, you know, when we think about the season at the start of the season, we think, you know, what, what do we want revealed in episode 7 out of 13? How about episode 10 out of 13? And then, of course, the big reveals come in the climactic final episode. Final episode, this was uh, written by Sam and Jim, the creators of the show. Um, it's terrific. It's a really stunning three-handkerchief uh, episode. Oh, that God. Well, I mean, if people have people been watching, they kind of have a sense, I think I have a sense of where it must be going uh, because it's been pretty pretty laid out so yeah and the, th the thing that strikes me uh, and I, I love the show my wife and I've been watching it from from the very beginning and uh, we dragged my at first we didn't drag my daughter into it who's now 16 but was probably 13 14 when it began and uh, we didn't bring her in at first because it, you know it, it was it can be a bit grisly uh, a little gory uh, just stunning what happens to some people on the show but it's it's always real clever we brought her in last season and now she watches it with us um, but the thing that struck me, and I'm curious to get your take on this, is that um, in the third season, what I really like about it is that whereas the first two seasons, there was a lot of um, kind of the tr – and if people who haven't seen the show, uh, there's someone on each week who, who's a resident of the, sit the town of Haven who generally has the troubles. There's something – wrong with them it's usually seems like it's triggered by uh, some emotional issue that they're dealing with um and uh but it seems like in the third season the show has kind of evolved from the troubles of the week 
to layering a lot more stuff besides just the Colorado, the ongoing Colorado Kid mystery with with uh, um, Audrey Audrey Parker. The terminology that's used in the business uh, is serialization. You you talk about a show either having standalone episodes like Trouble of the Week, where each episode is self-contained and you can watch them in any order, uh, like the original Star Trek, for example, where there was no continuity from one episode to the next, except, I guess, the two episodes that had Harry Mudd in them. Uh, or serialized episodes, and Lost is an example of a heavily serialized show, or the original serials, which were the soap operas, where you have to watch each episode to understand what happens in the next episode. You want to strike a balance between the two because you don't want to be so serialized that viewers who haven't already watched all the prior episodes can't enjoy the show. So you always want there to be some story that's self-contained for people to enjoy if they're newcomers. Uh, but the serialized aspect really gives people who are longtime fans of a show a reward for coming back week after week. And it's also more fun to write, I think. Um, and we got the go-ahead from the network, from Sci-Fi, uh, this year to be more serialized. Previously, it, it, we'd really been doing, as you say, the trouble of the week had been the focus and the bits of serialized uh, storyline about Duke Crocker and his fate and so on were really just thrown in on the periphery because that's as much time as we were allowed to give it. And this season, for the first time, we were really given... Uh, free reign to be more serialized and I think it's made the show better. I think it's uh, certainly more interesting for longtime fans mm -hmm. like you and uh, I, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an experiment that's been successful. I'm very glad they let us do it. And I, can't, I, I can't pinpoint it but it, it feels to me like it, a little more uh, X-Files like. Uh, Chris Carter with the X-Files. It seemed like around the third and fourth season that the mythology in, involved in that show, Scully and Mulder and all the stuff going on with them, that Again, you you had the the uh, supernatural kind of mystery of the week that was going on, but it, it it started becoming secondary to the 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 mythos, the mythology that was being built around the main characters and all this crazy stuff around them, and and you could do that because you've established the characters and there's a you know there's a there's a loyal uh, base I, I I think. I, I think that's that's right. And you can go too far, and I think by the end of that show and some of the other shows out there, you know, Buffy, which I loved, had a kind of weak last season. Sometimes you get so deep into the mythology that, as a writer, you can forget that uh, you know your primary job is to entertain people week by week, and and the casual viewer might not be as fascinated as you are by some arcane detail of mythology. Um, and so I was sorry with the way X Files ended. I was sorry about the way Buffy ended. Uh, and lost. But and, and lost as well, that's right. It's very hard to end things and end them well. You know, you want something that is surprising, but once you see the surprise, it's inevitable. You really feel that the story led them all along, and finding that balance is hard. Uh, but in seasons three and four, X-Files was great. You know, in seasons three and four, Buffy was great, although four might actually have been a weak one also, but three and five, five was great. Uh, and so I'm, I'm hopeful that the, uh, the Haven story gets to be told not only in seasons three and four, but five and six and seven. And hopefully we, you know, we don't have a falling off in quality when eight comes along. Uh, but we're, we're certainly in, in a good place now. I definitely feel season two took it places that we weren't in season one. Season three is even stronger, and, and uh, I can't wait to go up to L.A. in uh, January and figure out what season four should look like. I, I tell you what, we, we, the, the middle of the uh, third season, uh, and my wife and I had kind of stockpiled some episodes, so we wound up watching like four of them in a weekend. Uh, yeah. and, and the pace has picked up so much, and there's stuff going on, and you're just like, holy crap, what on earth is going on? This is, I mean, you know, things are happening much, much faster, and it's really, it's really interesting. And I, I was so happy for uh, Eric Balfour for a moment, anyway, in that uh, when he was on with us, uh, a funny thing happened with him. Uh, I got him uh, at the end of a, a radio tour, and um, uh, there was some issue that day. I can't remember if, if, if he was running short or I was running short. Anyway... I got. I, I wound up being his last interview of the day, and he was so surprised that I was so interested in the show um, that yeah. you know we got to the these things are usually ten minutes long, and I said, well, I know you have to go. He said, I can keep talking. He says, you seem like you're interested in the show. Look, we can keep talking. I think we talked for about half an hour, which I'm sure yeah. made the operator who put those calls together crazy. But um, you know, one of the things I talked to him about was you know I said you know I think it's kind of time, and this was in the first season for. You know, forget about Nathan. I mean, I, I I thought at the time that he was a very dull character, and it just didn't see anything there. I said, you know, it's really kind of time. I think Duke and Audrey really need to, you know, yep. kind of heat things up a bit. He says, absolutely. I am totally with you on that. And, you know, we've seen that this season. There's been that kind of moving together and yet moving. Well, 
No, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Of course, I, I'm always a fan of the underdog. And, you know, the rakish Han Solo type character, the bad boy, the pirate, uh, will always have followers, especially when the actor is good looking and a good actor and so on. And Eric's terrific. Uh, Lucas is also a terrific actor. And if you ever meet him in person, you'll find that he's goofy and funny and he's all that he has to keep in check when playing Nathan Wernos because Nathan has no feelings. He has right. emotions. He's a Vulcan, but he has no physical ability to feel. Uh, that's his trouble. And so Nathan plays him in a very laconic, understated way. Uh, sorry, Nathan. Lucas plays him that way. And, uh, and so it's very easy for him not to be the scene stealer, you know, in any scene. But boy, he's, he's got wit and he's got charm and he's so handsome. We've got fan letters. Uh, we go on Twitter. You see people writing uh, what amounts to modern day fan mail to... Uh, Ethan and talking about how gorgeous he is and so forth. Um, so I, I think there's there's definitely a triangle there. It's uh, you know all, all three actors are are not only attractive people but uh, they embody their characters with a lot of emotion and a lot of heart. So you know a lot of people care about what happens to these characters. Uh, so you know will will Audrey end up with one or the other? Well, wait and see. Yeah. And uh, uh, let me take this all the way back to uh, because this originated with the book that you published, uh, The Colorado Kid, with Stephen King. Um, do you have any sense of his, his feelings about the show and the way it's gone? Uh, you know, we haven't talked about it much. From time to time, we've exchanged emails, and I'm aware he certainly knows about the show, and he watches it from time to time. And uh, I think I got a note the last time I had an episode that I wrote, which was nice of him. He knew when I was going up to film uh, the last time. But uh, but we never had a conversation where he said, oh, in episode 14, well, it was in episode 14, in episode 12 of season two, I would have done this differently. You know, I think he's very happy to let Haven be Haven, which is its own thing. It's very different from the book. I mean, if you ever did read the book, you find not only is there no supernatural element, there's no Audrey Parker in the book. Uh, there's an FBI in the book. Uh, the two newspaper guys are there, Vince and Dave, and uh, the Great Gull is there. So there are some elements, but the book is a very different animal from the, uh, uh, from the series. The premise of the series of a town that is a home, a haven to people with supernatural afflictions, that premise wasn't in the book. So, you know, I think Steve is thrilled that that they used uh, Colorado Kid as a jumping off point and then let their imaginations run free. Uh, but they can only let their imaginations run free if he keeps his hands off. And so he's inclined to do that. Well, it's been interesting to me. I, I know I, I'm not a huge Stephen King reader. I, I you know, in the 70s and uh, when I was in college, uh, certainly I, I, you know, it was, the, it was the big thing. Everybody was reading these massive Stephen King books. And I, I get, I'm not a big horror fan, and it just didn't really grab me. And I always found it interesting that as popular as he was, the, the the studios would make these movies based on on his things, and they just didn't really work, except for the one with uh, 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 Kathy Bates. I thought yep. that was that was a, an amazing film. But um, he's, he's he's had a lot of success with these uh, with the Dead Zone and with uh, I think with Haven. Um, on now, as, as we say, four years, it'll be the fourth year next year. Um, he's had success on television. Some miniseries on television also were quite successful. He did a Stan miniseries yeah. and Storm of the Century and some others. It. Uh, and it, right? Um, he has had enormous success in movies, both critical and financial, but it's movies that people often don't associate with him, like Shawshank Redemption. That's one of the movies people pick on their top ten of all time list, and deservedly so. That's based on a Stephen King short story. But you don't think of it as a King story, because it's a prison story. It's really not a horror story. Uh, the Green Mile was based on a Stephen King story. Uh, Misery, as you said, is another one. So there have been some really acclaimed and, and terrific movies. And, of course, Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, which he didn't care for himself, but, of course, is a classic. Uh, so there have been some successes, and then there, of course, have been some that didn't work well. Uh, and I think it's wonderful that he's had a chance to see his work adapted so broadly. Uh, if you haven't read a uh, Stephen King book in a while, you might pick up his last big bestseller, which was called 112263, and it's a time travel story about preventing the Kennedy assassination. There are moments in it that are horrific. There are certainly violence and so on, but it's not a horror novel. It's yeah. it's a time travel novel. It's alternate history, science fiction, uh, and it's terrific. It's it's really a great read. I'm sorry. What Kennedy assassination? <laughs> Maybe exactly. it worked. It worked. It must have worked because I don't know what you're talking about. With Kennedy assassination, which is a different story. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> Just so yeah, anyone who is a fan of uh, Stephen King books and is watching here, the new book is called Joyland. It's coming next June from Hard Case Crime, and it's the story of a uh, college student from Maine who goes to North Carolina for a summer job at an amusement park and learns that the amusement park is reputed to be haunted. The ghost of a murdered girl is supposed to reside in the 
uh, haunted house of all places. Where else would a ghost reside? Of course. And much gets learned uh, about life and loss. And it is another book that you'll need your three handkerchiefs at the end of because you'll be crying. And that's uh, Joyland. 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 Uh, and why, you know, I'm kind of curious, uh, why does uh, a guy like King, who can publish with the biggest uh, that there is, why does he place stories, I mean, I, I read a lot of the hard case books. I mean, I think they're really good, and you, you have obviously good taste and good sense of, you know, uh, there, there's, a, there's a brand there. But why, why does a guy like Stephen King place stories with you? I'm kind of curious. Well, ultimately, you'd have to ask him. But if I had to guess, I would say the following. He grew up reading books by authors like Ed McBain and Earl Stanley Gardner and Richard Prather, some of the other writers we've published and reprinted if they've been out of print. And back in the day, Richard Prather sold tens of millions of copies. Stephen, uh, not Stephen, sorry, uh, Mickey Spillane mm-hmm. sold tens of millions of copies. These were big names. And today, if you stop someone on the street and you say, maybe Mickey Spillane, they would remember, uh, they, they'd remember his detective, Mike Hammer. They would not remember Richard Prather, much less people like Gil Brewer or Day Keen or Cornell Woolrich or David Goodis. But these were great writers, and their work has more or less been lost. And what Steve knows is that without a line like Hard Case Crime out there, they may remain lost forever, and readers might be denied forever the pleasure of reading their books. Whereas if Hard Case Crime is around, someone might pick up a Day Keen novel who otherwise would never have heard of Day Keen and enjoy a book as good as Home is the Sailor by Day Keen. Uh, and then there's a whole new generation of would-be hard-boiled novelists who might not ever get a chance to publish their books if it weren't for a line like, like Hard Case Crime. And by giving one book every few years to Hard Case Crime, he ensures that we stay on the map, that we also have enough revenue coming in to pay for some of these other books that don't make nearly as much money uh, for the publisher. You know, sometimes these books lose money for the publisher, but we still do it out of love of the genre. And I think he wants to support that. Well, and that fits in well with the, the, the kind of the line of questions I wanted to wrap up with, which was we didn't get to this the last time about hard case. Um, is that a is there a market, you know, if we have some, some readers who are uh, authors or would-be authors, is, are you a market for the unknown author? or? Or Although we publish very few books. So at this point, we're publishing maybe four or five books per year, and we've got a thousand submissions. So it is very hard to break. We have to say no to 99 plus percent of all the books we see, even some excellent ones. So it is hard to sell us books, but it's not like it never happens. We do buy four or five a year, and they are sometimes by new writers. For example, I got a submission from an agent but we get submissions that don't come from agents, too, and that's fine. But this one came from an agent, and it was 180,000 words long. Now, most people don't read books, so they don't know how long is that. It's the length of three of our normal books. One of our normal books might run 60,000 words. And so I said, I don't even want to read this. The agent, Just take a look. Just take a look. And I started reading it. And every page as I was reading, I kept wanting it to be bad so I could stop reading. So long. I didn't want to finish it. I couldn't put it down. And page after page, I kept waiting for it to go wrong and get bad so I could just stop reading the damn thing, mm. and it would get bad. So I got to the last page, and I said, if I don't buy this book, this book that I was fighting not to like every page of the way, and I loved it, I should get out of the business. So I bought it. It became, it's, it's called The 20 Year Death by Ariel S. Winter. I read it. It's his first, you read it. Uh, it got a full-page review in the New York Times, which called it extraordinary. It got raised from authors, including Stephen King, and it served it. It's a terrific book, and you couldn't possibly imagine when you read it that it's the guy's first novel. Uh, it's just really well-written. It's satisfying. And so that's an example of a guy who came out of nowhere with no publication history and sold not only a book, but in some sense three books back to, back to hard case crime. And they've done very, very well for us. So it is possible. Uh, I don't want to be too encouraging. I don't want to be falsely encouraging. Uh, because the most likely answer is no, but if a writer has a book that th- he or she thinks is a good fit for us, absolutely send it to editor at hardcasecrime.com. Somebody will take a look at it. And uh, Somebody. There's only one person here, uh, so I'll take a look at it, and most likely the answer will be no, but there's always the chance. We're looking for needles in haystacks, and as long as you've got a needle to send us, give it a shot. I, I, I have to say, I, I, I read the entire book, I like the first two, essentially the first two of the three books the best. I thought that they really, really grabbed it. I, a little, a little. I enjoyed the third, but I, 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 the first two were really good. The first two parts of that. The funny thing about the reviews for this book, both from ordinary citizens, readers, and from professional media experts like you, and from major publications, the the uh, interesting thing is that every reviewer has a different take on which two were the best, which uh-huh. one. So I could give you a, f- a file full of reviews that said book one was easily the best. 
Another one that says book two was easily the best. Another one that another says book three was easily the best. Um, that's not to say that any of these people are wrong. They're just saying that's the one I liked. Mm-hmm. And they're written in three very different styles. Mm-hmm. The style of George Simenon, Raymond Chandler, and Jim Thompson. And just as there are some Thompson fans who hate Simenon and vice versa, people who like book one more than three and vice versa. Uh, my own personal favorite is book one. Mm-hmm. Uh, that respect, we, I agree. We, yeah. But I might actually rank book three over book two, personally. It's just a question of what you happen to like better. Yeah. Uh, I loved all three, and it was it was definitely fun to work on the book. Yeah, I I read Simonon in college, and uh, uh, so is, to, to, you're reading that, and you know, then I as I'm reading through that first book, I, I'm thinking the style, and then I wanted to go back and read the the notes and read you know read up a little bit, and it's like oh Simonon, of course, it's just uh, something very compelling about it that most American audiences have not been exposed to. It's very cool. So I read it. All right. Well, uh, listen, we. Uh, you know, we have to stop meeting like this. Um, More than once every two months. <laughs> uh, folks, uh, listen, you can, uh, you can watch Haven uh, in the last couple of weeks of this season. It'll be back for fourth season, thank goodness. Uh, it's every Friday night at 10 p.m. only on the Sci-Fi Network in the U.S. And what's the network in uh, Canada? Uh, for some reason, the name Shaw is coming to mind, but I bet I'm wrong. I, I don't know why that name is stuck in my head. I, but, but look it up online. I'm sure the Sci-Fi uh, uh, the sci-fi website will have links to other networks around the you know especially if they're part of the nbc family as sci-fi itself is right well and and i'll point out that if you're not familiar with the show if you go to sci-fi and it's s-y-f-y dot com slash haven you can actually catch up the, the the five most recent episodes are on the website you can watch them for free Watch these episodes. You will catch up on the the, the mythology, the troubles, uh, the whole uh, Audrey Duke uh, Nathan uh, triangle, uh, the bolt gun killer. It's uh, it's really a phenomenal series if you haven't been introduced to it yet. Um, and uh, so I gave the website for that. You want to give the website out for Hard Case Crime just for folks? Give me the chance. It's www.hardcasecrime.com, and we'd love to have you read our books. That'd be great. Um, Charles, uh, pleasure to have you again, and thanks so much for joining us again on Mr. Media. Thank you so much. All right. You can see and hear almost a thousand Mr. Media interviews by visiting our main site, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Or check out the more than 200 video interviews on the Mr. Media radio site on YouTube. And I'd sure appreciate if you'd show some love for Mr. Media's advertisers, including Stitcher. Apple named Stitcher a top five news app of 2011. It's a free mobile app for your smartphone or tablet that lets you listen to your favorite shows and discover the best of news, entertainment, and sports on demand. You can listen whenever you want to to more than 5,000 shows, get customized recommendations, and discover what your friends are listening to. My own list of Stitcher favorites is pretty eclectic. I start my day with an hour of MSNBC's Morning Joe with Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. Then it's the latest two-minute update from the Onion News Network. After that, I'll listen to WTF with Mark Marin. Here's The Thing with Alec Baldwin, HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, and excerpts from E's Chelsea Lately and The Soup with Joel McHale. Also in regular rotation on my Stitcher playlist, The BS Report with ESPN's Bill Simmons, The Tech Crunch Headlines, and The Don Geronimo Show. The latest episodes of each show, whether originating from broadcasts, cable TV, radio syndication, or podcasts, are continuously updated. Stitcher is a free app for your iPhone, iPad, Kindle, Fire, Blackberry, Droid, and more. And show your support of Mr. Media by getting, did I mention it's free? The app at stitcher.com slash mrmedia. That's stitcher.com slash mrmedia. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. We're also supported by Audible. Check out Audible's 30-day trial membership and download the audiobook version of the book everyone's been talking about, Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. Sign up for your free trial today at audible.com slash radio. Again, audibletrial.com slash radio. 
And finally, if you need a disc jockey for a wedding, bar mitzvah, corporate event, or just a big old party, please consider calling 1-800-DIAL-DJs, the party authority, for all your party entertainment needs. You can call 1-800-DIAL-DJs or go to their website, 1-800-DIAL-DJs.com, and tell them Mr. Media sent you. And thanks for listening.